Thank you for coming to my talk. You depend on DNS. This is how it works, and you won't believe it. I'm here with Jane Street. Please come and see our booth downstairs, but this talk is, talk is not work-related. And I expect 50% of you will know 50% of this stuff already. So my challenge is to show everybody something they haven't seen before. Uh, the error budget for this talk is 5%. There are 39 slides, so this will move pretty fast. Now, how do you liven up a dry technical subject? Choosing interesting photos can help, but it's a copyright minefield. Fortunately, we can now use generative artificial intelligence. <laughs> The slides and the text are all written by me, but all of these images are created by Midjourney. Let's see how well that goes. Uh, we're off to a bad start. The prompt here was two ping pong bats. <coughs> um, so risking my good reputation, let's, let's try a live demo as a very quick intro. Um, the top panel here is a TCP dump uh, for an authoritative DNS server hosting dnsdemo.org, which I've bought just for this talk. In the lower panel, we'll trigger a name lookup. So there we go. And we're going to go ping intranet. Cool. It's working. Demo over. Um, why are there so many queries? Firstly, this is an IPv6 aware server uh, box. So we're looking up both A and quad A records. Also, I have three subdomains in the search path. So, altogether, we do six lookups for one result. The good news is all these lookups can be cached, even the failures. Go back to the slides. Our local DNS resolver will answer queries from cached responses wherever possible, but if it doesn't know the answer, then this happens. As a cold cache example, this is what the recursive resolver is doing. At each stage of a successful lookup, Authoritative DNS servers either answer the question or respond with a delegation to the next level of the hierarchy. I'm worried people might be drifting off, so how do you liven up a dry technical subject? That's right, prizes. Um, can anyone name this DNS pioneer? Anyone? It's not Vixie? Correct. You win this limited edition iDigDNS mouse mat. Please come up at the end. The esteemed gentleman. The esteemed gentleman is Paul McPetrus, the inventor of the DNS. He always uses the DNS in interviews. In the 1980s, he worked at the Information Sciences Institute, creating the initial design for the DNS. But who can remember what came before DNS? In the beginning, was the host's file, maintained by the Stanford Research Institute. But by 1985, hosts.txt had grown to over 200 networks and 1,000 hosts, which, as we can see, is difficult to fit on a single printout. Let's travel back in time, have a look. This version is from 1983, but it bears some resemblance to your ETC hosts file. Then, as now, it was difficult to think up good naming schemes. For example, MIT sysadmins in 1983 used cleaning products. And when they ran out of cleaning products, beer. So if one giant list is unmanageable, what can we do? Divide it up amongst the different administrative organizations and glue everything together in a hierarchical namespace. You can download the root zone file for some light bedtime reading. Don't worry, it only has one and a half thousand delegations. Um, but by comparison, as of yesterday, .com has 160 million registrations. Um, did you notice in our TCP dump that there are mixed, mixed case query strings? I'll highlight one. There we go. Why is that? I didn't type intranet in mixed case. The problem is DNS poisoning. There isn't much entropy in a DNS request. So if you assume a recursive resolver will occasionally look up google.com, you can fire UDP packets with answers to those queries, and some will get through, and now you've poisoned the cache. The ID field helps, but it's only 16 bits. The UDP client port number is another 16 bits, but where can we find more entropy? By convention, the query, Q name itself, is case insensitive. 
So by randomly making each character upper or lower case, we gain one bit of entropy. An attacker would now need to guess the same query ID and UDP port number and uppercase characters to return a poisoned response. The paper describing this technique is increased DNS forgery resistance through X20 bit encoding. Why X20? As everyone knows, upper and lowercase ASCII characters are the same apart from bit six, so we can quickly convert between upper and lowercase by setting and clearing the X20 bit. This technique has been implemented in Google's 8888 public DNS service since earlier this year, but Cloudflare, OpenDNS, and Quad9 don't use this technique, I checked. This all feels rather hacky. Isn't there a better way to validate responses from authoritative servers? Why DNSSEC? As we saw in the previous talk, encryption can provide confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. But DNS as deployed in 1985 didn't cover any of these. If you connect to mybank.com and the address comes back 12.10.4.1, no average user can tell whether it's legitimate. I'm not talking here about the browser padlock, but the DNS lookup itself. Let's talk about DNSSEC. By adding a complicated chain of signatures from the root zone, we can provide integrity, is this record unaltered, and authenticity, is this record really from cloudflare.com, but we're missing confidentiality. If you want that, switch to DNS over TLS, or HTTPS, or QUIC, but that's for next year's talk. We won't do a deep dive into the crypto, but just note the highlighted fields here are the expiry and inception timestamps. How do we know that this RRSIG record is valid? Well, the public key for cloudflare.com is published in the .com zone. The public key for .com is published by the root, but the public key for the root is published by IANA. That's not the ultimate source of trust. That comes from a signed PDF last generated in 2017. When I say signed PDF, I mean actually physically signed. <laughs> So this key, generated in 2017, is used to sign the root zone key around four times per year. How can we have confidence that the root key signing key is properly handled? Well, every few months, the DNS wizards gather for the key signing key ceremony. Let's watch a video of a recent event. <laughs> Sorry, that's the wrong clip. Here's a video of a recent ceremony. Now, if you'd like to attend, just visit the URL for the application form. Uh, this video is about four hours long, so I'm afraid we'll have to press on. <clears throat> um, this has all been running for years, so is everyone happy with DNSSEC? <clears throat> Next. A sticking point in the deployment of DNSSEC was the handling of negative results. If you ask for srecon.org, it's no good having an unsigned response saying it doesn't exist. We need a signed response from the .org servers. But how would that work? We can't create signed records for everything that doesn't exist. We could generate them on the fly, but that would require the private key to be available to internet-facing DNS servers, which is terrifying. What we can do instead is sign the gaps. Here's a real example from the root zone. If we request, say, shopping.blackmonday, the NSEC response says there's nothing between Black Friday and Blockbuster, and the RRSIG record signs the NSEC record. This is technically fine and functional, but by making sequential queries, we can enumerate an entire domain. For the root zone, this is okay, but some private companies don't want to be enumerated. It spills the beans. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, here's another example from the .org zone. We've requested srecon.org, but this time, NSEC3 provides a solution to the enumeration problem by hashing the boundary record names. You can't use this NSEC3 response to determine any other valid .org records. So we've talked about the data plane a lot. Let's fly over to the control plane. Editing a zone file is easy, but how do we add a new domain into the global hierarchy? Earlier we saw dnsdemo.org, but how was it created? Here are a few domains I could have registered. But you don't deal directly with the people who run .org instead. You pay a registrar, they talk to the registry, probably via the extensible provisioning protocol, and create a new entry in the top level .org zone. Then you need to set up a DNS server responsive to requests for records under dnsdemo.org and wait for traffic to arrive on port 53. Thinking back to that hosts.txt file, which had plain host names, but then transitioned to the first group of zones, which were those. 
RFC 920 gave us .arpa for transitional use, then the original six top-level domains, then the ISO 3166 country codes. Um, what was the most recent country code edition in 2011? Anyone? No, not Eritrea. South Sudan, you win a limited edition mouse mat. Please come up at the end. <clears throat> oh, too much. The best way to create a new ISO country code is therefore to partition an existing country. For example, if Eastern Dublin, where we are now, declared independence, we could be .ed, which would be great for some domain names. We could have evicted for legal help, or pulled for online dating, or weed for um, our gardening tips. <laughs> but what if we can't form a new country? We just need to persuade IANA to edit the root zone for us. In the first 28 years, we added 16 generic top-level domains. Then in 2012, all hell broke loose. Now anyone can create a TLD for the low, low fee of $185,000. If everyone else uh, here chips in, maybe we can get .srecon. Um, what's missing from our timeline? All of these TLDs are in English, or at least in ASCII. Why is it Köln with an E? and not Köln with an umlaut. From 2010 onwards, TLDs in non-Latin scripts were introduced. But how does that work? We said earlier the DNS only uses ASCII. Did it start supporting UTF-8? No, it's so much more complicated. Um, in 2003, we finally realized that not everyone speaks English or uses an alphabet which can faithfully be represented using ASCII. Uh, Unicode can provide all the characters we need, but UTF-8 won't work for the encoding. Are you ready to see some punicode? Here are a couple of real examples of internationalized domain names. Bolya Ohaklir is the Irish name for Dublin, and how is your Cyrillic? Uh, Telegram.online is the second example. Here is the standard method for converting Unicode strings to ASCII strings suitable for use in DNS. At the last stage, the ASCII compatible encoding prefix is added to signify that this name has been converted. But why is it XN dash dash? Reading back through the mailing list discussion, some people just wanted to choose XX, but others wanted very hard to avoid the illusion of bias, the appearance of bias. How to avoid bias? We need a source of randomness, which is difficult to influence, but easily verified after the fact. Any ideas? On Monday, the 10th of February, 2003, a butterfly flapped its wings, and the trading volumes of IBM and Intel and 10 other stocks were fed into an MD5 hash, modulo the 18 candidate strings, selecting the 11th choice, XN. <laughs> One more share of IBM, and we'd all have a different standard. So if we have a way to convert Unicode to ASCII compatible, can we register thumbsup.com? Because the RFC standards are no fun, this isn't allowed. But in which case, how did somebody register xn-n3h or snowman.com? I don't know. <clears throat> Let's talk about how much DNS traffic can be generated by a single function. Chrome allows searches from the address bar, or Omnibox. So if you just type intranet, is that a search for the term intranet or the name of some internal host? To find out, Chrome performs a DNS lookup. If it's a match, Chrome th can then display a did you mean link above the search results page. Tiny problem is that some recursive resolvers want to claim that everything is a valid host name, including every single word search that you type. So to avoid spurious did you mean prompts, Chrome needs to know if it can trust DNS results. It performs some sneaky background lookups for randomly generated strings. If these return anything other than NX domain, we assume the requests are being intercepted and therefore don't display the did you mean prompt. For better or worse, Chrome is a pretty popular browser. And in 2020, over 50% of queries to root name servers were these kind of probes. Um, here's a graph of root name server queries over six months of 2020. I know you can't read the axes. The green section is successful lookups. The red section is NX domain and the black line is the release of Chrome 87 in November 2020. From that version onwards, the DNS probes were removed and the NX domain results from the root servers fell away. 
There's much more we could say about DNS, but that's all the time I have. You depend on DNS. That's some of how it works, and did you believe it? Thank you.